Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz guitarist Bruce Foreman. He has a new project, a 2018 CD called Junkyard Duo with Jake Reed and Jay Bellarose. He spoke to us about his childhood in Texas, moving to San Francisco where he opted out of college and went on to perform with local musicians like Ray Brown, George Cables, Joe Henderson, Freddie Hubbard, Bobby Hutcherson, and even Woody Shaw. It was a real world experience and education. That would lead to a tour with the great Richie Cole for several years during the late 70s and early 80s, and he got that sound refined. He's got a lot of mileage on his jazz odometer, and he has wise tales to back all of them up. Please get to know him and dig this interview, my friends. Hey, Bruce, it's an honor to speak with you. You're always popping up on my jazz radar, so thank you for taking a minute out. I appreciate it. Man, this is great. Thanks for thanks for having me visit Kansas City, man. I love that town. We always love visitors. That's what we do. <laughs> yeah. Let me go ahead and start off right here and ask about Junkyard Duo. It's the elephant in the room, your latest release. It's a great <laughs> album. <laughs> How do you feel about this album? Well, you know, it's funny you should say that because we were going to name the band the Elephant in the Room, but we went with Junkyard <laughs> Duo. So I like it. <laughs> um, it was just a band that, you know, just like so many musical things, just sort of happened. It it was built around first of all a guitar I had from my previous days with my band Cowbop when we would do Route 66 challenges. We'd go down the street and play on the street, and I needed the band's sound was kind of the guitar playing lines with the horn. And uh, acoustic guitars just weren't loud enough and didn't have enough sustain without an amp, which kind of took the band sound away. So I kind of, with the National Guitar Company, invented like a tricone resonator that was super loud and uh, the notes would sustain. So I could actually play somewhat, you know, we could do like the guitar and horn bebop saying that we were you know it was our sound the guitar just sort of sits there in the closet when i'm not doing those kinds of things and then one day i just had this i had a local little gig in la and um bass players being as difficult as they are to you know get for gigs sometimes uh we just decided to go without and i talked the drummer into bringing just a, a drum set of reclaimed objects nothing but you know boxes and chains and brake drums and frying pans and and things of that nature. You know, a trashy symbol would be okay, something like garbage can lid kind of vibe. And then we just uh, took that and just made up music, you know, totally improvisational on the spot. I mean, we either played some of my arrangements and my trio tunes or everything from Count Basie to Ornette Coleman, basically, and Ry Cooter, you know, was, was up for grabs. And it just became a thing, and we just sort of, we loved that the sonic palette really drew us into new places. And of course, not having the bass just made the uh, potential to modulate and change keys a lot, which this instrument really, uh, it really does exaggerate the key changes because of the way the open strings resonate. So it was just sort of a accidental uh, junkyard happening. And we made it work, and next thing you know, here we are. We got records out, we're touring, you know what I mean? Another mistake of mine that goes, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say viral, more like uh, mildly uh, infectious. <laughs> Speaking of, I was just thinking, one of the greatest inventions of all time that really did break up the infectious strain in our world was penicillin. No one thought uh, the mold that was going to grow on that orange in that lab was going to do anything. So those are the happiest accidents. Yeah, they are. And, you know, I mean, reaching uh, a, a veteran status in the music, you know, basically having survived as long as I have. I'm not going to pull the geezer card out, but, um, you know, I feel like I'm free to expl experiment. This is the time to really challenge myself in, in ways that are going to uh, make me bring new things out of the music and bring new things to the music. That's, you know, kind of where I've really been hanging my hat these days of course luckily i get so much opportunity to play straight ahead with all my friends and side men and duo projects with other people that you know i'm i'm very satiated and happy you know swinging down the road with all my pals so that's been great you know as the years slip on it always seems like with an instrument like 
the guitar and jazz really is something that didn't happen a lot in the beginning, and as time has gone on, more and more players are out there. It seems like I'm on a roll here on Neon Jazz of interviewing jazz guitarists over and over, and there's so many out there. Why does the jazz guitar work so well in the world of jazz? Basically, you know, well, uh, I, I can say that not everybody will agree with you that the guitar belongs in jazz. There's numerous piano players that uh, resent our are taking up so much harmonic space. But that being said, I really love the the way the guitar just kind of spans all the various roles of music. You know, it's it's highly rhythmic. It can be very harmonic. It's super melodic. You know, so it, it, like all the things the horns can do, say really sustain a note w w unless you have uh, effects. Of course, you can do that too. It's just such a versatile instrument on so many levels, and therefore the various players who have gone to play it have really brought new things to it. I think it's a highly personal instrument. The, the generic problems of the guitar only happen when, when guys copy other people, not really because of uh, the limitations of the instrument, per se, is my feeling. So let me go back to the beginnings of your life here and ask you, what was your childhood in Texas like? How did you get into uh, and music? Well, you know, um, my childhood in Texas it was pretty cool, and, you know, I was... I played classical piano first. I started at about five or six. Normal kid playing sports and riding horses and doing all that kind of stuff and switched to guitar about 12 and then was introduced to Charlie Parker at about 14. And then we moved to San Francisco. But uh, when I heard Bird, there was a lot of music that I'd heard throughout my life that was either very much like that or on the edge of that. And I, it was just sort of like, oh, that's what that is kind of moment. Huh. Yeah, you know what I mean? It was like I mean, yeah. here I was, I'd switched to guitar and I was playing what everybody else was playing, little Beatles songs and blues and, you know, that kind of stuff, pop tunes and um, just hanging around playing with buddies. And when I heard Bird, it was just like, oh, that's that music. I mean, you could trace it back to those Cab Calloway movies that I'd seen and Betty Boop cartoons and having heard Bob Wills and those guys play, you know, all that stuff. It just sort of triggered like, that's it. And it was almost like I crossed the threshold musically that have yet to leave that room. <laughs> it's like the embodiment of freedom, and it's this unbelievable testament to the human spirit and imagination. It enables you to play hot and cold, free and tight. I mean, you can have as much structure as you want and still work it, or you can just, like, literally not have structure in it and it it calls on you you know pull all the harmonic and melodic and basic emotional palette from yourself let me ask you about higher education what did you do after high school talk to me about some mentors and your educational path well you know my educational path was different than i guess uh, well it was probably rather normal for then i just uh i was fortunate to be in san francisco where there was this club called keystone corner where they six nights a week had literally every major touring jazz act in the world. I mean, you do, you know, for six nights you'd hear Bobby Hutcherson or Ross on Roland Kirk or George Benson or Bill Evans or Stan Getz, Max Roach, Elvin Jones, McCoy Tyner. You, you, I mean, and everybody, Freddie Hubbard, everybody else liked that. And so obviously I spent all my evenings there. And if I was working a gig, I would just show up afterwards and hang and catch the last bit and last set and meet the guys. But just like to sit and listen to that and realize the commitment to the music and their amazing ability, just their, their creativity, the community itself was so rich and vibrant. The people were really innovative individuals who it shot, that came through in their music. It, it was just such a opportunity. And of course, San Francisco itself, where I was working and playing, had so many just phenomenally talented players. You, most people haven't heard of them because they weren't really necessarily touring players, but they were great mentors to me. And all these people just uh, took me under their wing. You know, I mean, I made a deal out of like my goal getting on the bandstand was I sound bad, so they'll let me do it again. <laughs> you know, and, uh, <laughs> I, de I developed a, a strategy for sitting in. Most of all, learn, being able to learn tunes quickly, but doing my homework before I got there and uh, not getting in the way and just, you know, really keying on the melody. To me, the melody was always my 
goal. You know, if I knew that melody and I just stayed close to that, I could never get in trouble, you know, and uh, could stay creative. And then once I got past that, if I wanted to get fancy, as it were, you know, I, I had it was that was just kind of the icing on the cake. And everybody was real encouraging at that time. And there was lots of places to play. And then even then when I started going on tour, I went with Richie Cole and with Bobby Hutcherson and Freddie Hubbard and Ray Brown. Um, these guys were incredibly tough, but incredibly supportive at the same time. Even we, we lived that music. That was what we were there to do. And the commitment to it and the love of it shined through. You know, we weren't looking to have careers or, uh, you know what I mean? Or social networks. We were just like into creating real networks, you know, well, social networks that were actually real people, you know, and not on a computer. So, I mean, it was a whole different world and it was, it really shaped me. And now that I'm teaching in the higher education world, uh, I'm trying my best to keep that model going in my my personal studio with my students, you know, to really like work on the mentoring thing, let them figure it out by doing it, encouraging, demanding total commitment to the playing and not like treating it like homework, but treating it like life work. A long answer to a short question, I figure, but sorry about that. You hit some things along the way that I was interested in, but I want to ask you this. We've talked about Texas. You mentioned San Francisco. You've also mentioned New York. How have you stitched together these very different sides in the middle of this country to make your sound? I, I think it's it's really weird how um, I remember when I was a kid and, of course, dealing with younger players, there's this pervading sense of, like, i got to find my sound. You know, i got to be me. i got to be me. i got to be me. And then, like, at some point in your late 30s, I think you kind of realize, you go, oh, no. I'm me. <laughs> it's just, it just, it just sort of happens. You know, that's an organic thing. I mean, everything that's synthetically controlled ends up being that I, in my personal opinion, in my own personal experience and what I've observed around me, everything that's synthetically controlled or conceived seems to fail on, uh, on certain levels. Whereas, you know, just, I mean, I wouldn't be the way I was if I hadn't met the musicians and played with them, hadn't experienced the things I had, hadn't lived the things I had, hadn't gotten in the bands that I was in, um, hadn't lived the life experiences of of going on the road and living in strange places. You know what I mean? It's like you can't really divorce. You are who you are your sound. If you really want this to be a successful thing, in my opinion, you never stop learning. You never stop checking stuff out and incorporating it incorporating it into what you do but your sound is you and should be you Absolutely. and worrying about it too much it's just like worrying about something that you don't have any control over almost you know you've won a lot of awards you've got recognition over your career and i don't want to know what your favorite award is but i want to know what one surprised you the most i don't know i mean they all surprised me you know deep inside my own self i'm uh, struggling striving, <laughs> highly self-critical human. So they all surprise me. I think one thing stands out to me, and this is going to almost sound funny to you. One night I was working with Jimmy Cobb and Jack McDuff in Europe. We were hanging out after the gig. I think it was Italy. And we were hanging out after the gig. We had to go, and I went to go get my amp, and my amp was gone. And I thought it was stolen. And uh, Jimmy said, no, I, I, I loaded it in for you. And I looked at him and I said, you know, I mean, Jimmy's a good 20 years older than me, you know, and those amps are stupid heavy. It was hard for me to carry. And then and then he came up to me and says, I just want to thank you for keeping this all together. Like, I guess he and Jack, although it sure didn't sound like we're having, like, time trouble locking up time-wise, and he had, like, thanked me for kind of laying down the middle of the groove so he could play. I just always think of that moment as like, this is cool. I guess I can do this now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Jimmy <laughs> Cobb said to me, thank you for holding it together, you know, and, and, and loaded my amp, which was a Fender Twin, which is the equivalent to carrying a locomotive engine. You know, it's just <laughs> stupid heavy. That That's just one that you, when you said that brought to mind. I know it's not the exact answer to your question, but <laughs> it's an answer. That's, that, that's the best answer I've gotten in all of the years. I don't want to cheapen anybody else, but, that answer has such a personal anecdotal sense to it. 
It's one of my favorite answers. I love it. You know, you, you've had a long winding path from watching these luminaries in San Francisco to playing with those same luminaries and doing everything that you've done. How do you feel about your career at this point? I'm proud of the achievements I've had. I'm embarrassed by the numerous humiliations that I've I've had, you know, I mean, just screwing up on the bandstand. I never intended to, but I'm always going for things that are beyond my reach, as I was always encouraged to do by those same mentors. So, you know, I mean, I can, you know, more often than not, I'll think back at that time where I blew something <laughs> really bad, you know, what I mean, on the bandstand. I'm really very concerned with my new projects, uh, the Junkyard Duo being one. I have another one called The Red Guitar, which is a one-man show I do where I tell a story about a life in the pursuit of sound while I play and um, sort of explain a lot of the jazz process while I'm doing it simultaneously. And I'm real proud of that and just excited to uh, play every day. It's just the beautiful thing about this uh, every day. And, I, and I, I almost don't believe it. Like I am more excited to play and enjoy playing more today than I did the first day or any other day since. It's, I'm so lucky to have just this pursuit of this thing and to be in this amazing community people at this time in the world. It's just, I can't believe in the good fortune. You know, I just count my blessings. So I want to get back to the live performances you've seen. You know, what you've seen would be considered legendary performances that people would love to go back and see. So I want to ask you, this, uh -huh. if, if you could sure. get into the time machine and you could go back to Jazz DeLorean, so to speak, and go and see a show, where are you going? Who are you going to see? I never saw Louis Armstrong. I would just love to spend 15 minutes with Louis Armstrong. I think basically if we have to put jazz in a uh, time capsule for, for a thousand years from now for people to know what it was, I think you put five minutes to Louis Armstrong's life in, a, in that capsule and they'll get it. You know, to me, that was somebody that I would just love to hear and hang out with. You know, I never got that opportunity. So I would just have to say that would be my answer. <laughs> I mean, cool. you, you, you know, nailing it down to one thing is almost impossible, but if that would be it, you know, I, I would love to hang with Pops and hear him live. So let me ask you this. Why do you love jazz? Well, why do I love jazz? That's an interesting thing, and it's, and it's a thing that I deal with in my one-man show. You know, it's, of course, it's the sound and the feeling of it. That's what attracts us to all of it. But, you know, all of us who play music in general and jazz in particular have, like, that in common, that the sound just grabbed us and changed our lives. But then there's other elements that go on. I mean, I know some people want to get money and some people want you know, love and fame, and some people want girls <laughs> or whatever. For me, along with just the the sound of it, the freedom in it, just the exuberance of it and the brilliance of it, another thing is the community of it. I mean, you got to understand, I was playing jazz in San Francisco in the late 60s and 70s. That's when I started. You know what was happening in San Francisco in the late 60s, early 70s. I mean, that was like Absolutely. the world ground zero for us for that kind of music, you know, for the music that's still popular today. I was like a Mr. Magoo. I found jazz, and even though I knew the rock thing was happening, and I even got to play with those guys, and got to hang, get high with them, and do jam sessions, the community of jazz musicians were so brilliant, so individual, so open, so um, committed to their craft and art. The community was just also something beyond the sound and things I mentioned, the challenge and the open, just if you want to play this way, this would work. You can make it work if you can do it. You know what I mean? Jazz has that sort of open-ended, no boundaries that pretty much every other music I had ever tried to play, and not to say that I was an experienced player at that point, but pretty much, you know, you try to play a curtain kind of music, oh, those notes don't work, oh, those rhythms don't work. You know what I mean? It was like through classical music, oh, you got to phrase it this way, you know, and there was like, got to jazz, it was like, well, if you can make it sound good, it works. You know, you just got to justify it with, with you know, with the way it sounds and your commitment to it. Between those two things, I believe that that's what makes jazz and my love of jazz still so great, is, is this community of 
individuals, you know, and unfortunately, as the community grows, there's a lot of copycats and a lot of guys, I think, who are really misguided as to what the the, the music is, you know, when, you know, I mean, it's like, I mean, God, I want to be West Montgomery too, but you know, West did it. And, you know, I'm going to take what he did and try and make it into my own thing or leave it alone. You know, I mean, yeah. I've transcribed as much West Montgomery as anybody ever has, but you won't really hear it in my playing too much because I'm, I'm me, you know, and I want that to be the, you know, as much as I'd probably rather be West Montgomery. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. you know, there's a certain sort of honesty that I believe that needs to exist in in context of the unbelievable challenges and brilliance of the art form of jazz. Let me ask you this. Let me get down to hyper-local with you. And everyone has a version of you, your family, your friends, your fans. But you're guiding your vessel. Who do you think you are? Boy, you know, it depends on how you ask that question, huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It could be uh, in a bar late at night or in the middle of the day. <laughs> well, you know, I'm a guy that just wants to tell stories and create community and be endlessly challenged in, on all the levels. You know, I mean, I want to be challenged in my playing, of course, and in my composing and writing, but I also want to be challenged on the teaching level by all the great students I have to find new ways to do things. I want to be challenged on the business level find a, in, in with this amazing tools of the Internet and social media to find new ways of reaching out and creating community. I just, that's who I am. I just want to be challenged and figure out the next way to do something. You know, ultimately, I mean, all, all our purpose is the same thing, to hopefully leave the world a little bit better than we found it. That's what we all share in common. And what you want to create to help have that happen, you know. I feel certain the people that I love know I love them. And uh, I also know that no, no matter how many people don't like my music or, you know, or maybe neutral about it, I'm sure they're well aware that I am. Um, that I'm committed to what I do and I love it and I have integrity and I work really hard at it. So that's good enough for me. I like it. And Bruce, this interview was just as refreshing as your music. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your artistry. I appreciate it. Well, thanks for the call and thanks for the opportunity to talk to everybody. I sure hope I get out to Kansas City real soon. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Texas, San Francisco, New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the globe, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Bruce for his time, his stories, and his honesty. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.